Nothing changes in my life until I change, right? And that's the thing that people start to understand. What I do know is that when the brain starts functioning in a level of order or coherence, more neurons are recruited and bigger communities. And that kind of holism that's created is so important. The other thing we realize is that when people really heal their heart, they heal their mind. Like mm. There's no, I have no doubt about that. You cannot do one without the other. And when there's enough energy in the heart, and we, we've seen this, we've, we've got the, we've got the technology to see that when the heart starts working, when people start doing it properly, there's this low frequency in the heart that starts to rise. It's only indigenous to the heart because they have their attention on it. Uh. Where you place your attention is where you place your energy. So they're filling the gas tank up, and when it gets to a certain point, here comes the parasympathetic nervous system saying, get out of the stress response, get relaxed, and then all of a sudden you think that would be over. But it's not, then the parasympathetic nervous system drops down and the sympathetic nervous system comes up. And when the sympathetic nervous system comes up, now the person's relaxed and awake. Like they're really relaxed in their heart and they're really awake in their brain. That state is so much better than being stressed out and unconscious <laughs> in a program, right? So turns out when you get to that state, when the heart starts informing the brain, it resets the baseline for the trauma that's stored in the brain, in the amygdala. It's informing the brain that the event is over. Mm. Because the emotion that they're feeling is dragging the body out of the past, yes. right to the present. And when they feel that glory, that really rich feeling where it's like, oh my God, this is something that I haven't felt since I was nine years old or six years old. And it's this familiar feeling in their heart, the words, many people use blows wide open when they look back at their past their trauma the loss the betrayal the abuse sexually physically emotionally so many times the person doesn't want to change one thing why is that because it brought them to this moment and now the moment is okay and all of that's okay because i'm okay and they look back at their betrayers and their abusers and they have nothing but compassion, they see, the, they see the whole thing. They're seeing their past from a greater level of consciousness, right? So, so now that it resets the baseline yes. and the event is over and there goes the endometriosis. There goes the suicidal tendencies. Wow. There goes the rashes. There goes the gum disease, whatever it is. Just, just the body gets an upgrade. It's no longer believing it's in the same trauma 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year because they're living unconsciously or subconsciously in that emotional program right so so then so then what happens to what happens to that person they belong to the future now they no longer belong to the past and so it's almost like they don't even have to do much now it's almost like they're happy for no reason <laughs> and and they're okay with themselves yes and when you're okay with yourself you're okay with everybody that's just the way it is, right? So, you, this one woman told a story. How she had a lot of abuse in her life, mm -hmm. a lot of abuse by a lot of family members. And um, she was in her meditation, and, and she thought, "I'm doing this all wrong." Like, she, the amount of emotion just came out of nowhere, and she was about ready to give up. And then she thought about the nine months or year, however long it was, where she never missed a day of doing her meditation. And she said it was just like, it was such a horrible feeling that she didn't think she could go any further. And then she just said, I'm just gonna go one more time. And she just went right past it and then, heart blew wide open. Wow. Literally reborn, literally a different person. Like, like every biological, condition that she had every uh, 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 mental health condition gone all the all the supplements all the drugs all that stuff gone away and so then the question is what happens when the chemo isn't working what happens when the radiation isn't working what happens when the surgery didn't work what happens when the the ketogenic gluten-free vegan diet didn't work what 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 now right what now because a cancer researcher on the stage with stage four sarcoma, 
she, she did all the drug and trials. She was a researcher. Re cancer researcher. And she had the cancer. Had the cancer. Nothing was worse. She did all the drug trials, all the chemo. She tried the, the rare, vegan, rare, she tried the this. everything. The rare, rare gene of 1.001% 1, 1. of the population. She's a physician. She's a researcher. She made sense to her. No cancer in her anywhere. Not in her bones any longer. I mean, not, not, out of the bones. I mean, it's insane. I mean, you, you ask any physician. If something got metastasized to the bones, you're pretty much going to be with that for right. a long, long time. All of a sudden, it's gone. Like you know, so like again, those kind of things, those four-minute miles, uh, give people permission to step yeah. into that same same footprint. So what is the point when all those other things aren't working? Yeah. And it only means one other thing: it's not going to work unless I change, and nothing changes in my life until I change. Right, and that's the thing that people start to understand. It wasn't about her healing. It was about her disbelief. It was about her emotions, that she mismanaged her emotions under too much stress. And mm -hmm. she's like, oh my God, nobody's worth this. Like nobody is worth this. This is not loving to me. I got to stop this. I understand now what I'm doing to my brain and my body by doing this. Like, big moment, right? And you look around and not a lot of other people are thinking this way, but you come to an event and everybody is. But mm. out in the world, you know, it's just the, the program is like, you need something out there. That didn't work. We have something else for you, right? So that's a, that's a lot of taking our power back. Here, here's my thought about it. And it's a, it's a tightrope for me to walk this. I think that a lot of plant medicines fit into the same receptors, uh, serotonin and melatonin, and they tweak the brain to fire in a different way, which gives us an altered perception from outside of ourselves, mm -hmm. which for a lot of people, we need that. Step away from where you, you're, you're, you're just seeing situation. reality from a different dimension. Yes. You're not, you're not seeing it from you. You're seeing it from a different place. And, and for some people that journey is painful and it creates nausea and vomiting. And, you know, and some people have kind of wind up really getting really trapped and other people have really profound experiences, right? So, if the person has the transcendental experience from the plant medicine, my most fundamental important question for them is, what are you going to do with that? Right. Is that going to change your lack? Is that going to change your, your life? If, if that insight somehow causes you to act on it, because it changes your perception of the world, and it truly causes you to be whatever it is, whatever the, the, whatever the experience is, to, to take that piece with you, and use it in some way. That's great. But for many people, insight never changes behavior. Mm -hmm. You can understand that your father was overbearing. You can understand that, that Saturn is in the wrong house. You know, you can, all of that stuff. You could understand that, you know, that there's a, there's a chemical imbalance in your brain. None of that. You could understand all kinds of things, but that won't really change your life. Mm -hmm. Really? It doesn't really change your life. So there are people who have done 65 ayahuasca sessions because they have cancer and the cancer hasn't changed. My advice to them is try something else. Right. Right. Just come on. Come <laughs> yeah, on. Like yeah. that's it's just, just let's make a different move here. So, yeah. so my concern is, is that this is human nature. Everybody has this, you know, you take a, something and it makes pain go away. You take something and it gives you an altered perception of whatever. You notice that you got a change in your body. You remember what caused it. And so every time you feel that whatever, you remember to do that, right? So now you got a dependency on something outside of you. So then, so now you need that substance in order to take feeling, away, right? take away, yeah, take away the other, other feeling. That's not what this work is about. This work is about actually self-regulating and changing that feeling without anything outside mm -hmm. of you, right? Does that create mystical experiences? Profound mystical experiences in our work. Do we have the data? Yeah, we have great data to suggest that those high gamma states, the person is having a full-on sensory experience without their senses. And the brain is not having a little bit of energy. It's not having a lot of energy. It's having a supernatural amount of energy, like <laughs> more than you would ever record. Like the brain is way outside of normal, way outside of normal like hundreds of standard deviations outside of normal in that state. So, so it's important then for us to realize that if, if we're using that substance to, to regulate our emotional state, I would say to that person, work on changing that emotional state mm. before you take the substance and then take the substance and have a great trip.
There you go, yeah. yeah exactly. Have a fun trip, right? <laughs> um, I really don't really have a whole lot of fears I'm looking for. I feel really good about my team. I feel really good about our research. Yeah. I feel really good about the way we run events. I mean, I've always, you know, we, there's always growth pains, you know, and, and mm -hmm. you know, we, we outgrow things and we have to do things different, you know, differently. Um, I just want to stay healthy yeah. enough to be able to continue to do this. I'd love to get some uh, people uh, that I trust to be able to help me do some of this, you know, on the stage a little bit more. Sure, sure. Um, and I really want to make this work not about me. I right. never want it to That's be about me. Yeah, I want yeah. it to be about you, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I do really, you know, I do my best to try to be the example sure. of everything that I teach. I had always driven and it was okay because, I mean, I think, you know, being driven is really great, but then when I started to really want to experiment with creating from the field instead of from matter, if I decided to create something, then I went and did it, then I didn't let the creation happen because I got in there. You were I was driven. You were I, was, I, was, I was in the habit of doing it. Do, 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 right? So at 40, I, I just started to experiment with it a little bit more, and I, and I think I learned how to, I had to, I had to um, inhibit the need to kind of do it because because on some level I doubted it was going to happen, right? So at 40, I was just starting to experiment a little bit more with this. I mean, this is when I was, you know, getting interested in it. So I probably tell myself to lighten up and make it more playful. I mean, I'm really good when I'm goofy and silly and playful right? and curious. It's not really good when I'm like rigid and forcing. It's just not, it's just not me.